Hi, uh, I'm Oliver Gao. I'm the director of Cornell System Engineering Program. I have been very fortunate to conduct these system conversations uh, with prestigious speakers that we bring to Cornell for our Ezra System Seminar Series. Today, I'm very honored uh, to bring to you uh, Professor uh, Stefan Hess. Actually, Professor Hess, you know, he is a professor of choice modeling at the Institute of Transportation Studies at the University of Leeds. And I believe that he's also the head of uh, the Center for Choice Modeling. Of course, uh, you know, Professor Hess, he has served um, a multiple, I think, editorial board for uh, many different journals surrounding, I think, choice modeling. And he's certainly, I would call, a champion uh, in uh, choice modeling. And of course, I think nowadays, while people were concerned a lot about, especially with the engineering, we're talking a lot about engineering systems, but even within engineering systems, we have to deal with human behavior, which I believe uh, is professor um, has uh, major research. So Stefan, welcome to Cornell. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. So uh, uh, I, I, I saw that you know uh, your research has been focused on you know choice modeling, and uh, you know I'm also a transportation researcher. Uh, you know I work on transportation and air pollution and how that impact public health. And uh, while most engineers were taking an engineer approach, but in the end, I realized you know transportation is really a demand-driven service sector. So which is the key is demand. And when we talk about demand, of course, that leads to human behavior and uh, and the human choices. So uh, you know you've been you know leading in many frontiers in the choice model. Please tell us more about you know how your career evolved and also how your views evolved in building your career uh, until today and even mm. into the future? Yeah, so my, my interest um, my interest in choice modeling started in, in a conversation with um, John Pollack, who then later became my PhD supervisor. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a meeting and uh, I had some very broad ideas about wanting to do a PhD in transport and he said, well, you know, there is this field called choice modeling and mm -hmm. He explained to me what it was about and it became very clear to me that, well, this was mathematically interesting but was also so fundamental to transport, like you're saying, you know, the transport system wouldn't need to exist if people didn't travel. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I, I became um, more and more interested in the, in the methods. Uh, transport is my key area of application but my interest is really in the mathematical modeling of human behavior and you know, with, with applications across the board, not just in transport, but in other areas as well. And you know, when you think about it, everything, everything people do is interrelated in some ways anyway. So it makes a lot of sense to look at the, look at the broader picture of um, people's choices on a, on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. uh, across different components of their lives. Absolutely, and I think, Stefan, I very much agree with you. Any decision, is all about making choices, uh, uh, right? So, so speak of that, uh, in, uh, and also I think you mentioned that uh, uh, the choice modeling um, got an interest because at that time um, you heard that it it was mathematically mm. uh, either challenging or interesting. So mm. it sounds like so basically your uh, the deep root of interest really you know stems from your interest in math. But then you are probably trying to find a good area to use your mathematical skills or develop your mathematical skills. Yeah, I think so. And and it's you know it's this area that is like you say is scientifically challenging, mm -hmm. but at the same time has clear real world resonance and, and benefits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 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 with that, um, you know, choices. As this, you know, the choices either choices from us individuals mm. versus choices made by people in Washington D.C., mm. uh, in London, right? All these choices. So, what, from your experience, what are the major factors behind uh, the choices uh, that human beings make? I, I that's difficult, and it depends on what you're, what you're thinking of, what you're looking at mm -hmm. um, you know um, I think in most settings that we face we have different options available to us and we evaluate those in, in whatever way that we do that mm -hmm. and we make you know I think humans essentially make trade-offs mm 
that um, you can't always get the the perfect product or the perfect service, mm -hmm. and that's what is such an important component in the modeling of, of those choices. You know, if there was always a, a perfect product for someone to choose, we wouldn't need to model it because mm -hmm. everyone would choose the same thing. So it's trying to understand how people make those trade-offs, how they choose between different products or services, and also how that varies across individual people. That's the, that's the challenging part. Yes, it is. It, you know, kind of a, a variability. So, um, so I think you mentioned you mentioned a keyword which is trade offs, mm. right? People are uh, when they're making choices, they are making uh, trade offs, and also you know a choice is made by an individual or a, a decision maker versus a set of the choices that mm. they are facing. So which means that this is really a, a match or an interaction between the subject and also probably the features. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know of the of the alternatives in uh, in the choice set, right? So and then, but you know, for this, uh, how does math come in? Uh, in uh, so basically, you basically you know, the reason I you know the, the logic I was asking first, you know, what what the factors are behind these choices, and basically now how how can model this kind yeah. of choice making? Okay, so well, obviously. People don't use maths to make their decisions. That's right. Some people maybe do, um, but at the end of the day, what we what we need to try and do, we need to operationalize the choice process in some way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so people go into a, let's say you go and buy a new car. You walk into the the, uh, the sales room. You mm -hmm. see the different vehicles available to you with different properties, and you make a decision between those different vehicles. <coughs> What, a, what an analyst needs to be able to do is to quantify that process in some way. Yes. Um, and you know, there's different ways of, of doing this. Fundamentally, a lot of what we do is grounded in, in economic theory of behavior. Yes. And the idea that people behave in a rational way, make trade-offs between different features of a vehicle and choose whichever one is best for them. Mm -hmm. okay? And you know, the reason we need a mathematical model for that is because what we want to be able to do, we want to quantify what is the influence of different components of those cars on, on people's choices and hence on the demand at the, at the population level, but also in order to be able to predict what might happen in the future. Mm -hmm. So, you know, any kind of, you know, of course there are other disciplines that look at human behavior without a mathematical model, um, you know, purely from a psychological perspective, for example, but that doesn't allow you to quantify the role of these different factors, and it also doesn't really allow you to predict what might happen in the future mm -hmm. if products change. That's right. So yeah. So um, of course, you know that that way, it's, you know, there is a, you know stated preferences versus realized preferences, and of course, I think as researchers, you know, we want, as you mentioned, we want to quantify possibly these relationships, and hopefully, even these relationships can be used to predict. The future or the uh, you know the implications of our policy interventions, mm. uh, right? So, for this kind, of, you mentioned you know like the economic theory uh, that kind of assuming uh, that human beings or the the choice makers they are rational, right? You know rational uh, economic uh, entities yeah. right? they are making these decisions. You know one thing is uh, you know for this kind of choice modeling, of course, you know the random utility theory and of course. We're assuming that everyone is trying to maximize uh, their utility, um, but I think in your also in the same community that you come from, the the choice modeling, there were also people talking about you know instead of maximizing the utility, they are trying to minimizing they are trying to minimize the regret. Mm. So can you share like you know, what are the difference and why and you know, how how are these two uh, you know comparing to each other and also do do they do they have their individual application areas? And then if they are, mm. where should we use maximum utility? Where should we mm. use? <laughs> I think it depends on what you want it to do. So, yes. um, look, random utility is a, a framework that has served the community well and has the advantage of strong microeconomic foundations. Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the, I think the, the people that have criticized random utility, sometimes, 
for lack of behavioral realism or not being able to deal with anomalies in behavior. Um, sometimes the point that's missing in that is that we, we acknowledge that random utility is just an approximation. You know, it's a, it's a toolbox that works well, mm -hmm. that is um, doing quite well at replicating the behavior that we see in the data and has the advantage that it's quite computationally tractable and produces outputs that we can use for policy analysis. Mm -hmm. okay? Now, um, many choice models, me included, are interested in looking at departures from those frameworks to increase the, you know, the, the capability of the model to deal with those behavioral anomalies. Mm -hmm. um, doing so comes at the cost of losing the links to economic theory and, and producing results that are maybe not suitable for use in, in a policy framework, in an appraisal framework. Okay? So it depends on, depends on why, we're, why we're doing this. If we're, if we're doing modeling to try and um, not even understand how people make choices, because we'll never be able to see into people's brains properly to understand that, mm -hmm. But maybe if we're doing this to try and understand what kind of behavioral theories might do better at explaining specific people's choices, mm -hmm. that's highly interesting and, and quite relevant, maybe with a view to understanding how we can nudge people in the direction of better choices. Okay? But on the other hand, if we're doing work to advise the um, you know, Department of Transportation about you know, what is the value of travel time, how much mm -hmm. are people willing to pay to reduce their travel time by an hour, those kind of results can only really reliably come from models that have the strong microeconomic foundations. So just like decision makers have to make trade-offs mm -hmm. when they choose between products, modelers have to make trade-offs when they choose between models. That's right. And I think that's, of course, I think, you know, uh, uh, very quickly relate to the talk you gave earlier today, right? So. Um, you know, the, the random utility theory, all this economic theory, and I very much agree with you because when, when our work is related to economic theory and that actually get, give us the access or the bridge to the policy makers, mm -hmm. because they mostly speak the economics language, right, mm -hmm. and also. Uh, so with that, of course, now there is also, you know, this machine learning and all, all this new school of modeling. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think you, I think you, you present a very, uh, I think a very, uh, very good perspective in not really just in the pick apples or oranges, but ha however, probably maybe we can hybrid them, mm -hmm. uh, right? So uh, please, uh, you know, uh, tell our audience more about, so um, the impact and also implications. I th it's, it's essentially uh, the big data and the data science and how does that impact, uh, the, you know, the choice, the traditional choice modeling community and yeah. how can you, how can you take advantage of that? Yeah, so, I mean, as I said in the talk earlier today, I and many other people in my field probably initially saw machine learning as a, as a bit of an existential threat to what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, then we probably for a while just saw it as more of a nuisance and a hyped up topic because we didn't really believe that it could answer the same kind of questions that, mm -hmm. that we're asking. And I think what we're what we're converging around now is the idea that we we still want really strong behavioral foundations in our models especially if we want to use those models for any real world applications and produce outputs that can be used by policymakers or industry but i think uh, with ever more complex data coming on stream and you know behavior maybe becoming more dynamic and the interactions between humans and machines, mm -hmm. to use one example, um, the ability to understand that data and the processes in that data before even thinking about producing a model, that's where you know, data-driven approaches, I think, have a, have a lot to contribute. Um, and then I think you know, just the, what, we've, what we're moving towards is the idea of really bringing these approaches together, like you said, in hybrid structures, mm -hmm. um, that combine the relative benefits of all of them in, in, in one big toolbox. Yeah, I think that, that, that's wonderful. Um, so one thing is that um, being, you know, when you were talking, I was thinking, as you said earlier, right, we 
we use economic theory, and then we use data and we model the behavior. And uh, hopefully, you know, that model is calibrated and validated mm -hmm. such that we can use a model. Yeah. I think the major purpose is for the model to predict, yeah. right? Predict, you know, given the future policy, what is the behavior. So yeah. basically, you say that we collect data and we add economic theory on top of it and we build a model and we predict. But it sounds now that you know, the data is becoming so big such that through the machine learning, you could even, you, you skip that theory part, you could go directly to prediction. Right. So of course, that way, the prediction, even though it's more like it's, it, it, it might be not a black box, you don't even have any good interpretability. However, it could perform better than the route through the theory. Or, and then, but yeah, that's why I think probably you kind of have a Bayesian approach. Like you, you combine the, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the prior and with new data and then you create a posterior. Yeah, I think it depends on what you want. You know, if you just wanted to, you know, essentially build a a, a digital copy of, of real behavior, and machine learning approaches might do very well. But if you're trying to understand that behavior from a behavior economic perspective, mm -hmm. if you wanted to understand the the drivers of behavior, or if you want to predict really outside the box and outside the distribution then I think it still remains essential for the modeler to have some, for want of a better word, control over the, the behavioral underpinnings and relationships in the model. Mm -hmm. Okay, So to not give the, the tool completely free reign in, in what it's doing. And you know, that's what part of the work I've talked about today was looking at, well, you know, we can use a, a data-driven model mm -hmm. neural network but we can impose some constraints on it some structure so to ensure that the model to a greater extent than you know a completely free neural network that it, it adheres to certain economic rules you know negative impacts of cost on demand for example that's right yeah so uh, so speak of this of course it can either we are either in whatever approach we are trying to use, but essentially, I think you know, we are trying to better understand and model the choice behavior. Right, mm -hmm. the key is really uh, the behavior, and uh, of course, you know, uh, it is very important. So, what are what are the key application areas that you see? You know, choice modeling and understanding will choice of choices will help us in our mm -hmm. society. So, basically, what what I'm trying to ask is that. Kind of, what what key challenges do you see ahead of our human society, and where you feel actually uh, you know choice modeling and also understandable choices can be very powerful in help us address that kind of challenge. Yeah, there's many, <laughs> <laughs> yes. and you know I think um, choice modeling has of course been used to address some such challenges. You know any kind of like transport policy in many mm -hmm. countries is, is based on the results from choice models. Um, you know, in health economics, they use a lot of uh, outputs from choice models as well. And, and, you know, the thing that we maybe don't see very much in the public domain is how much these models are used, you know, outside of academia, in, in mm -hmm. industry, mm -hmm. uh, to set prices of products, you know, even to determine the configuration of, of products. Um, now, uh, like you said, there are many challenges facing society, um, you know, environmental challenges, pandemics, mm -hmm. understanding how people react to those challenges and maybe also understanding how we can push people's behavior in, in, in different directions. Um, I think any model of behavior is helpful in that because it allows you to quantify things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the, the other thing is there are, I still think there is a, a missing link between a lot of, so I had really interesting conversation this morning with various students here working in water and energy and mm -hmm. they have really big models of just uh, water flow of, of rivers and how different policies impact that. And 
I think if those models had a human element in them, if there was a way to feed in the, the demand predictions from behavioral models into that system, it becomes a, a much more integrated process of you know, essentially a tool for policy mm -hmm. that allows you to understand the impact of behavior on policy, but also the impact of policy on behavior. Yeah, that's right. I think especially in the, uh, if we can predict the impact policy on behavior so that and these in matrix they can probably help I think from you know the water resources still they're trying to probably optimize their policy right yeah and but uh, most of the time you know this policy and uh, the consumers it you know they are really a coupled system right it's not a one direction it's really right you know they have this interdependence and also uh, these uh, these interactions so Stefan, I think you mentioned this and also you mentioned the environmental challenge. That of course relates to my own research. And I have been uh, quite frustrated because you see that um, if you tell everyone right, driving internal combustion vehicles, uh, it's not helpful mm. for the environment. It's, it's bad for uh, the climate change. Uh, right, even, so for example, even me, you know, I'm teaching a course related to these things. However, people, when they, as you said earlier, when they come to uh, the dealership uh, to buy a car or something, they don't necessarily think about these things. Yeah. So, so, and then with the, with the behavior understanding and also choice modeling, um, do you see hopes where we can, you know, influence and change human behavior? Is, you know, is that a... Do you think that is that an education problem or is that an economic problem? <laughs> Probably a bit of both. Um, I mean, I wouldn't want to, you know, talk about the educational side because that's not my area necessarily. Uh, but certainly, I think the and if you want to change behavior, you need to understand why people make the choices they're making at the moment. Okay. That's right. So you know, if you're thinking about why do people drive? Well, probably because it's convenient for them. Maybe it's cheaper and maybe it's faster. Okay, mm -hmm. and so you know, then you need to think about okay, how do you address that from a policy perspective? And well, you know, a good option, of course, is to make good public transport available. Um, mm -hmm. Another option, which is you know more of the stick approach, is to you know penalize car users by making parking. Less accessible, more expensive, mm -hmm. and so it's you know it's re and all of those things you can predict the impact of them by understanding how people value time, how they value accessibility, mm -hmm. frequency. Yeah, so so with that, uh, of course, you know, model can be built, and so is there any way based on the choice modeling result something can assume that you know you can design some experiment uh, to. To even you know kind of through pilot start or something, can we test out some policy alternatives? Yeah, so I mean, you you alluded earlier to you know revealed preference data and stated preference data, mm -hmm. and you know of course with stated preference data you could look at lots of hypothetical situations and, and understand how people might behave in them. The the issue becomes that you can develop models that will very well explain the behavior in the hypothetical data. Mm -hmm. The real question is whether the behavior in the hypothetical data is the same as it would be in reality. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you know, if, you're, if you're giving people a hypothetical setting where you're changing you know, the policy in, in, in Ithaca about driving into the campus, for example, mm -hmm. if you do that hypothetically, you will see an effect. Okay, people will change their behavior in the survey. The question is whether the impact in a real world setting would be, you know, stronger or less strong than it is in a hypothetical setting. And you know, those are questions um, that you know we, we grapple with in a lot of the studies that, that we do. And it's you know there is a lot of additional need for work on, on validating forecasts that come out of models, not just in choice modeling, but mm -hmm. elsewhere too. Yeah, that's right. So, um, of course, you know, for, for this kind of all this behavior standard choice modeling, you know, it, I think empowering the researchers with tools, mm 
will be so helpful. And I, I saw that you know you you have developed that Apollo, uh, you know, uh, toolbox or I call it a toolbox. Actually, it's I think it's a very powerful, uh, I think, uh, approach to actually not only for own research but really empowers research of many other people. So can you tell us more about you know that Apollo? Uh, yeah. You okay. Know? So yes. I mean I. I I've been developing code for my own use for you know over 20 years, and then uh, had a colleague uh, joined me in Leeds, David Palmer, and we gradually developed more and more routines and turned it into a package called Apollo, which um, is free. Mm -hmm. um, it's we think very powerful. We think probably the most flexible tool for choice modeling out there, and it has you know thousands of users around the world now. Mm -hmm. um, so. It's used across different disciplines and you know across the world, and you know the idea was always to try and make the tools, as in the mathematical models, mm -hmm. accessible to a wide audience, but still do it in such a way that um, you know the, these are these are very powerful tools, yes. and they're also tools where it's very easy for the analyst to misunderstand what they're doing or make mistakes. And the decisions that an analyst take um, takes have major impacts on the outputs from these models. So one of the the key aims of Apollo was always to try and yeah make the tools available but educate people at the same time, so that the, the methods are transparent but still accessible in the mm -hmm. software. So to not have a not have a black box essentially. Yeah, I, I, I totally you know agree and understand the point you are making because I think you know while we want to make the tools very powerful, and I, I think you made a very good point. You know the the tools and all these things are really transparent and the people can really see, because otherwise you see that when we build the tools and the users of the tools sometimes they skip, they just you know shower the data in. They get the result out, they put it out and without a deeper interpretation such that they could misuse Absolutely. a very easy tool. Absolutely. Um, you know, that's the key concern that you know the 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 models have become, you know, computationally much more tractable, accessible to a much wider audience mm -hmm. and that could mistakenly give the impression that these are easy models to use. You mm -hmm. know? A choice model is substantially more complex than a linear regression model. Okay? Yeah. And so um, I think that's where it's very important to essentially make sure that the analyst understands what they're doing and actually is involved in the in the process, in the specification of the model yes. rather than just you know throwing all the data at a model, getting the results out, and trying to interpret things from that. Yes, absolutely, because uh, uh, you know I think it's kind of otherwise, uh, and I really like you know kind of uh, you know it's not a and you don't want to make it a black box, uh, such that you can get people so that they can get in, uh, and particularly and you said actually this while your your Apollo package makes the work easier, however the work behind it. It's actually not simple. Mm. So I, you know, they might have, you know, even for using those models and the tools, there might be some very fundamental assumptions or prerequisite. Sometimes people will ignore, and right, they will use that. So that's why I think kind of for you know, like you know, model uh, diagnosis and you know, after even the step the model, mm. make sure that they can also you know follow through all the steps. Yeah. To check, you know, the distribution of error terms at the least, yeah. right? To to make those. So, uh, Stefan, you mentioned that people are from many different disciplines, not only in transportation, they are now using this. Mm -hmm. To then also you yourself, you have been doing work outside of uh, transport. Please share with us, you know, in, you know the the says the top exciting things outside of transportation you know, where you have yeah. been using the trust modeling. So. Um, I mean, if I was to give a, a view of what, you know, in terms of the disciplines in choice modeling, most of the methodological developments happen in transport, um, but now I think there's more applications being published in health than in transport, for example. Okay? Mm -hmm. So there are, you know, large 
academic groups working in choice modeling in health, uh, mm -hmm. understanding patient preferences, but also doctors' preferences. Um, you know, mm -hmm. ranging from topics as diverse as you know, treatment choices, uh, end of life decisions, insurance choices. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's in, in a health setting. There is a big community that looks at um, choices in an environmental context, especially mm -hmm. linked to the valuation of natural resources. Mm -hmm. um, choice modeling has a, a long history in, in marketing, so understanding consumer choices for different products. Yes, and actually I think this, this is actually, I think, you know, we're probably getting, you know, towards the end, uh, but I think, you know, in, System engineering, you know, system engineering has a pretty deep root uh, in military. You know that uh, system engineering got developed a lot uh, in World War One and World War Two. Of course, you know the the recent movie Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. That's that's you know Manhattan Project. You know has always been cited as a successful system engineering uh, project. Uh, but you know, system engineering is actually the application is you know its power is not limited within the military uh, mm -hmm. usage, actually outside. So that's why I here at Cornell, the system engineering program, we emphasize, we actually focus on commercial systems. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, commercial systems, that's where uh, human factors uh, always, uh, always come in. So in our program, we are, you know, we have about, we have more than 200 master engineering students and about, I think, 24 this year, Master of Science uh, student, and uh, as I mentioned, about 60 PhD student. Basically, you know, we, are, we want to train uh, these people uh, to enter into the future workforce mm -hmm. with a holistic uh, system of view. And especially, you know, with your work dealing with human behavior. So what do you think, you know, for future system engineers? And I believe, uh, I believe the major challenge really comes from the human factor rather than you know the you know fixed object because mm -hmm. these things we can control. So for the system engineers, uh, especially from your perspective related to you know um, social behavior, uh, this kind of science, as what do what would you recommend? What do you, uh, what recommendation would you make to our you know students here uh, to encourage them to learn and study re related to your area? Yeah, so I had I this is quite interesting. I had conversations with some of your students this morning, of oh, course. Yes. And you know the my my recommendation is that there needs to be at least some understanding of the, the human side and the, the way that the human side drives demand for for these products and services. Um, and and the the other thing is the interconnections between these different things. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you know, in, in a water use context, well, you know, what, what, what happens, for example, so it was, um, you know, if policy changes, behavior changes, but then if the behavior changes, does that affect how the policy might adjust once again? So there are many different ways of looking at these problems, but at the end of the day, the, there is a human factor in that. And if you can quantify that human factor in any way, mm -hmm. that will help your overall approach. Yeah, that's I think it's, it's the key word is to quantify it, mm. and I you know, I think quantify the human factor, uh, and I feel, and then and human any action any any decision is driven by choices. Mm. So I think this really illustrated I think it's imp really the importance of choice modeling and the behavior understanding. Uh, which plays a key role in, I think, all the, you know, the, from the simple system to complex system like, you know, the, the NASA or, you know, even, you know, the exploration to the Mars, uh, right, that's not only technology but also, uh, you know, I think human elements mm. uh, in that. So that's wonderful. So um, I think we're getting to the end. Do you have anything else that you would no, like to great. It's share with us? No, that's great. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank great you so to much. talk to you. Thank you. Yes, yeah.